accepting, uh, not accepting submissions here in the SAS no, Avenue. You made a submission look, to just, us. Just, just another My name is Elena Sassauer. I am director and co-founder of the Center for Judicial Accountability, Inc., a nonpartisan, nonprofit citizens organization that for more than a quarter of a century has documented the corruption of judicial selection, judicial discipline, and the judicial process itself. This includes the judiciary's corruption of the system of attorney discipline all aspects of which it controls and which it uses to protect and insulate from accountability politically connected attorneys and to retaliate against judicial whistleblowing ones. I am also privileged to be the daughter of two such judicial whistleblowing attorneys. My father, George Sassauer, was disbarred by a February 23, 1987 order of the Appellate Division Second Department for violating court orders requiring him to acquiesce to the court's cover-up of lawyer larceny of assets of an involuntarily dissolved corporation, assets which have yet to be accounted for by the court nearly 30 years later. My mother, Doris L. Sassauer, was indefinitely suspended by a June 14, 1991 so-called interim order of the Appellate Division Second Department without reasons, without findings, unsupported by a petition or by any hearing, as to which to date, nearly 25 years later, there have been no findings, no hearing, no appellate review. New York's court-controlled system of attorney discipline, as it currently exists, is 35 years old. And it has survived because no one in a position of power or influence has confronted the proof of its dysfunction, corruption, and politicization. It is because I knew and understand that the attorney disciplinary system cannot survive an evidentiary presentation, that I contacted the Office of Court Administration to find out whether hearings would be held, public hearings, because this commission, the Commission on Statewide Attorney Discipline, was, until the third week of June, inaccessible. It had no phone number, no website, no way for the public to contact it with the information born of direct personal experience and to furnish it with the documentation that it would need if it was going to conduct a legitimate, honest review. And it is to the credit of uh, now Chair Cozier and prior thereto, uh, Chair Prudenti, that uh, in response to my inquiries on the subject, that uh, they threw up a website and announced these public hearings. I have handed up <coughs> And I ask you to open the file folders so that we can examine together what I think uh, Mr. Zoderer uh, identified as something of concern to him, and that was the statistics. So the very first page are statistics. Now, I will tell you that the uh, Office of Court Administration does not make these statistics readily avail available. They're not on its website. Uh, they're not really anywhere, 
Uh, to the extent you can find anything, you can uh, get from the fourth department uh, its statistics, which are part of its annual report. And uh, the first department has its statistics in its annual report at the back. I have given you the page from the New York State Bar Association's annual report uh, put out by its committee on uh, uh, professional discipline. And uh, this is the most recent from 2012. Uh, let's just take a look at matters disposed of, OK, uh, for 2012, all right? Now, we talk about the grievance committees. But the fact of the matter is, the grievance committees are sham entities. They don't really exist. They're not operating as committees with all their membership because most of the complaints that are filed with the committees are going out at a stage where none of the committee members have ever seen those complaints. They're being processed by staff, all right? Now, if you look at the statistics here, you see, and because of lack of time, I, I, I don't want to dwell on it, but if you see that the three departments, the second, third, and fourth departments, are dismissing uh, between 45 and 52 percent of complaints they receive uh, are rejected by them as failing to state complaint, which means, of course, that they are purporting that the allegations, if true, wouldn't be misconduct, all right? But look at the first department. It's only 11 percent. That's too great a range. There's something wrong. There's, how do you account for that difference? Now look at the next category, dismissed or withdrawn. First of all, that category makes no sense, correct? Because a complaint that's dismissed is very different from a complaint that's withdrawn. They should be in, in separate categories, but they're bunched, they're bunched together, okay? But if you add up those two categories, and, and what you see in the first department is that it makes up for the statistical difference by dismissing 63% of complaints uh, for, it doesn't identify the reason, but it, they're being dismissed, okay, plus the 11. The cumulative statistic is that between 74% in, uh, in the first department, 63% in the second department, 69% in the third department, 75% in the fourth department are being dismissed at the outset. And the truth of it is that those dismissals are not being made by the committee. You can talk about the presence of non-lawyers on the committee. No non-lawyer, and actually it would appear that with the exception of possibly the first department, all these dismissals at the outset uh, are not seen by a single committee member, lawyer or lay. In the first department, these dismissals uh, possibly, and it's not clear from a reading of the rules, uh, are with the acquiescence of a single lawyer member, okay? So the lion's share of complaints, and how many are we talking about? Well, uh, we're talking about um, matters disposed of, uh, uh, well, you have thousands and thousands, uh, matters disposed of it, here it's 11,661 complaints. Okay, now, what can we tell from statistics? Well, the statistics are very li limited because the question is, are those dismissals appropriate? Are they correct? And to make that evaluation, you, you need to see the complaints. You need to see the complaints, and you need to compare them with the dismissal letters. What do the dismissal letters say about the complaints? And 
Is it consistent? Sounds well, like you have about one minute. Oh dear. Okay. All right, so let me very quickly tell you. In 1989, the state controller tried to do an audit of the Commission on Judicial Conduct, which wouldn't allow the controller access to its files. The controller knew that without access to the, the complaints, the record of complaints and the dismissals, he could make no assessment as to the legitimacy of the dismissals of complaints. And the commission wouldn't give access. And so he wrote a report called Not Accountable to the Public. You have no auditing in all these years. There's never been an independent auditing of the complaints filed with the grievance committees. You're not in a position to do an independent audit. But I will, since my time is up, I will. I'm sorry. OK. I want to just leave with a uh, All those who have testified should be, bring, should, provide, should be providing you with their complaints. I have, brought, I have brought here a sample, an illustrative sample of, oh, let's see, five here, five. Okay. And I have additionally, excuse me, I have additionally, uh, uh, I want to say that the important law review of uh, Professor Gillers, which really gave rise to this commission, as powerful as it is, it's flawed. Why? Because it never goes beneath the surface of the judicial decisions. And the judicial decisions over and again like the, the dismissals of complaints that are not really by the grievance committee but by staff are fraud. And you can, you can discern them by examining the case files. Here, Thank you, Mrs. Here, is, here is the case file. As the unconstitutionality of New York's attorney disciplinary law. You may be sure. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to say in conclusion, because, because Mr. Zotter asked another important question at the Albany hearing. Your time is up. And I was not, would you, would you repeat the question to me that you asked the President of the State Bar? I don't know what you're referring to. May I remind you? Thank you, sir. He, he asked me to remind him. He asked me to remind him. Thank you. Like Professor Gillers. Okay. Mr. Zauber asked the president of the of the state bar. Who spoke on No, no, he asked me. He asked me. He asked me to respond to the question that he asked the president of the state bar in Albany at the first hearing. Because the president of the state bar had testified about, about um, introducing discovery into the attorney disciplinary proceedings. And the, the State Bar has issued a report. Uh, and uh, Mr. Zotterer, because discovery is such a fundamental thing, it's a matter of due process, confrontation rights. And Mr. Zotterer asked the intelligent question, oh, what is the opposition? What could be the opposition to discovery? And believe it or not, the president of the state bar fumbled and was not really able to answer that question. And I said, I tried at the end, I, I said, I have the answer. And so now I'll give you the answer. Briefly. The answer is that in all the decades that we have had this attorney disciplinary regime, you may be sure that prosecuted attorneys have made motions and sought appeals and have raised the constitutional issue, among others, of their entitlement to discovery. They've raised it before the appellate division. 
They've raised it before the Court of Appeals. If you look in the records, the files, case files, and of course the case files, once an attorney is publicly disciplined, disbarred, or suspended, those files are all open to you. Okay, you have no bar. What you will see is they make the constitutional legal arguments. And the response from the court, denied. There's no discussion, no elucidation. There's nothing, and that's why there's no case law. And if you look at the report of the State Bar Association to you on the issue of discovery, it's it in the vacuum, just like, President, so just like Professor Beeler's article. Okay, don't you think attorneys have raised the equal protection invidiousness that is reflected by your article? Of course they have. And what has been the response? Denied.